The Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program is a relatively new grant program from USDA that came about as a way to address poor eating habits and obesity in young children. Because children from lower income households are at even higher risk of poor diets, the main eligibility criteria is K-8 schools with the highest free and reduced lunch participation. Only fresh, uncooked items are allowed. We do not serve canned, frozen, dry, or cooked items, and items are always served plain. FFVP is really a win for all schools. Research confirms that the program really does work. Exposing kids to more fruits and vegetables really does mean that kids eat more fruits and vegetables. But the program benefits are so much broader than just nutrition. It's usually incorporated into um, one of the curriculum areas, whether they're having health and they're eating the apple, or like our younger grade levels um, will do it during uh, workstation time. So the teacher might be teaching guided reading, and so one of their stations is they come around and they'll have um, time to eat their fruit before moving on to do something different. We had a couple of kiddos that needed a contribution, and um, so I asked those two students to come with me once a week to deliver the fruit. They do a great job of taking turns going into classrooms and, um, of course, pushing the button on the elevator and things like that. What are we going to do now? Eat papaya. Eat papaya. Gonna, have either of you had papaya before? No. Sweet? Yeah, really sweet. I like it. Yeah, I'm just gonna. It's so sweet. So I'm gonna go into class and say, Want a papaya? This it's is like called a papaya. Papaya! <laughs> and it's really sweet. That's what I'm gonna do. It's really, really juicy. And then when they try it. Classes can talk about where the produce is grown, how it's farmed, what it tastes like, what it looks like, the texture. It can be incorporated into just about any curriculum. And the positive influence of peers is just amazing. Seeing kids try new things with their friends is a positive, no pressure way to introduce new foods. This meeting of the Lincoln Public Schools Board of Education for April 23rd, 2019 is called to order. Laura, would you please call the roll? Ms. Byer. Here. Mr. Boswell. Present. Mrs. Danik. Here. Mrs. Duncan. Here. Mr. Mayhew. Present. Ms. Mungard. Here. Mr. Schulte. Present. The Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted and available in the main entrance of the room. We have minutes from our regular meeting on April 9th, 2019 for approval. Are there any additions or corrections? Seeing none, the minute stand approved is published. For our student celebration this evening, we take a closer look at the Nebraska College and Career Ready Science Standards and what that looks like for science instruction inside our classrooms. We will begin with James Blake, K-12 Science Curriculum Specialist for Lincoln Public Schools. Thank you, Connie. Thank you for having us here tonight. I've brought a crew with me, and we're going to see what it's like in a typical 8th grade science classroom in Lincoln Public Schools with the Nebraska College and Career Ready Science Standards. And you might even get to put your learner hat on, your student hat on, and reflect on how you experience science in 8th grade, and is it the same, is it different? We tend to think we keep improving on things. Um, to start us off, I'm going to introduce Jessica Weiner. She's an eighth grade teacher at SCO Middle School. Good evening. I am Jessica Weiner, and I am an eighth grade teacher at SCO Middle School. And this is Keith Swift. He is another eighth grade teacher at SCO Middle School. And we have new standards in science that are calling us teachers to elevate the doing and the curiosity of our students to not just content and concepts and vocabulary. We invite you, this is Hayden and this is Evelyn, and we invite you to put your learner hat on and experience science with us. 
they're going to demonstrate how we are learning science in the classroom with these new standards. We ask students, how do you sense sounds from a distance? Uh, as Ms. Weiner said, I'm Hayden. And I'm Evelyn. And we can hear the record by using a piece of paper, a needle, and obviously a record. Um, so today you're going to be the students and we're going to be the teachers. So your assignment yeah. is to write down one observation and one question on the sticky note you got. And we're going to spin the record. Swift at Scott Middle School, as Jessica said. Um, so the process that we'd start out with is students would actually create a model that James is showing, um, showing the sound source, the record, and then it's also showing the vibrations between the needle and the sound source. Uh, the middle part is just showing the transition of the sound, how it travels throughout, and then finally to our ears. So this is all student design. So they, they design it and they have a big say and what's taking place here. So what your job is going to do as a student soldier, or you being the students now, is to read your observation or question. If you're brave enough, you can try to tell us where on the model your question or observation would take place. Brave soul. Okay. Well, the observation I made was that the pitch of the uh, sound changed as the rate of rotation changed. Awesome. So I assume that's, that's going to take place uh, with the record itself. Sound source. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. My observation was that the sound was scratchy, so I would think that is with the needle and the record. Thanks. Yep, I had the same observation that the speed of rotation seems to be affecting the sound. Are we doing questions now, too, or are we going to do those later? Yeah, if you have uh, either one. So my question would be, uh, would a cone made of something other than paper uh, affect the sound quality? <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. Any other one? Uh, I, I, I noticed how simple the technology was. We tend to look at real complex technology for education, and here we have a cone and a needle. Very cost effective. Yeah, yes. and so then my question would be, what other types of items other than a record could you do something similar with? Hmm. How does it make the sound? That's what I want to know. So I know it has to do with the needle on there, it has to do with the rotation, but how does it make the sound into the cone? Because doesn't there have to be a vibration to make sound? So that, those are great questions that we would get, right? And we would put these on the board, and then the students would drive those, our learning. So Jessica and I would know what our next lesson is going to be. Um, we'd ask students, what's the next investigation that you would want to test with this? And most students, or almost all our students, would say, they want to look closer at that needle interaction. And we know in the back of our heads, or we're going to get microscopes out the next day, or we're going to look at that you know, under a magnifying glass. So the students really think that they're leading and have say in their learning. Mm -hmm. And we think that's really important in this new model that, that we're doing. Well, my observation is probably going to date me clear back to like the 1950s. So here we go. Uh, sound was less clear. Do you need to put a nickel on the needle? <laughs> and Doug's laughing, so he gets it. And my question was, what would you do to make the sound more clear using the same tools? I was pretty similar. I, had, I could understand some of the words and some of the words I couldn't. So how would we make it so I could understand it better? Did we ask all the wrong questions? Yes, and why does Dr. <laughs> why does Dr. Joel have a pink one? The rest of us have green. <laughs> so I wondered what, what what the sound would be like if the cone was reversed. Mm. Yeah. So my follow-up question is: <laughs> Does the learning come then in the questioning versus the learning come from today? We're going to learn how you hear sound and blah 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 blah, and then they have to repeat back to you. Is that is that the concept? Yeah, I get, I get the pink stick. Yeah. Yeah, so 
again, you got a little view into uh, two schools are enacting this lesson. It's a 20-day learning sequence, color and SCO. They've been our pilots with the new Nebraska standards. Next year, we're going to have all teachers experience this as the learner, as you did, in a half-day format, and then they'll have the option to get these materials and do this with their students. I think one difference is the co-construction of questions that students did with their teacher. I think as teachers, we know how things connect, but sometimes students might feel like it's the title of the chapter or the standard is why I'm learning this. And so by putting all their questions on the board before you dive into a 20-day sequence, hopefully you feel like, oh, this is a, we're doing this to figure out what's out there, not because it's the title of a textbook chapter. Um, just want to say thanks to Lincoln Public School science teachers. They're amazing, as we can see. Um, they're willing to be re-novice and try new things, even when they've taught for a long time and maybe even learned in a different way. So we couldn't do that without groups like this being so willing to embrace that. And just to appreciate that this took time for the teachers to get this good. They came out of school for a day and experienced this as the learner to turn around and teach with proficiency and just recognizing that importance of uh, professional learning. So with that, hopefully you can see that I think we've moved in the right directions with education policy that we're trying to elevate that doing of science to be as important as content, which sometimes it's easy to lose that. So questions you may have for any of us, for students, teachers? Okay, board, anyone have questions? Annie. I know you're surprised. Mm -hmm. So does the, does the understanding that everyone is learning come from slowly that would be my next. That would be my next one. Is how do you know that this young lady is learning the same thing that he is, or they're both getting it? I right. That's I may call up a teacher to respond to that. I know one thing I'd say is there's lots of opportunities to respond. So they're doing like written things on paper. Um, they've actually brought in Pear Deck, which is a digital format where they can all draw it digitally, and then they can pull up a set of class models. And so students can reflect on each other's work, and they can use that to lead to the class consensus model, which you saw. But anything you want to add? Yeah, I think as, as one of their teachers, we, we talk a lot in class. They see it, they do it, and then they talk about it, they draw it. And then they have a chance to listen to their classmates' ideas because it's good for them to know that someone might not have the same idea as me, but it doesn't mean that it's wrong. And we can have different ideas and get to the same learning. And there's a lot of formal assessments along the way that Keith and I do with our students to make sure that they're all learning. And it's just, they're, they're really into it. They're excited, they're engaged. I haven't seen this height of engagement in my classroom for a while, and this is my 12th year of teaching, I think. So the engagement is really leading the way, and they're excited, and they don't want to leave class because they want to know what's next, and there are questions on the board, and we get to all the questions, so they feel validated that their question got answered, so. That's great. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Well, thank you, students. Is there anything you want to share? Do you love it? Yeah, it's really fun. It's really fun. I will say. SCO teachers are cool. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, about, what about the SCO principal, Mr. Cedric Scott? <laughs> He's pretty cool, too. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, our next item is public comment. I do not have any blue cards up here. Uh, is there anyone wishing to speak? Very good, I will move on. Our next item is the consent agenda. Are there any items to be pulled from the consent agenda? Um, is there a motion for approval of the consent agenda? Ms. Danick? I would move approval of consent items 8.1, human resource matters, 8.2, routine business, 8.3 and 4, option enrollment, 8.34 and 5. Okay, is there a second, Ms. Byer? I, I second it. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments, or conflict statements this evening? Very good. Laura, would you please call the roll on the consent agenda? Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danning? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mumbar? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. All right, for first reading and action um, at our next meeting, or for first reading tonight, I have 9.1 evaluation and proposed compensation for the superintendent of schools. 
So as many of you know, annually the Board of Education evaluates and reviews the contract of the Superintendent of Schools. The 2018-19 evaluation of Dr. Steve Joel, Superintendent, is in the process of being completed and will be recommended for approval to be placed in his personnel file. Dr. Steve Joel's contract is being recommended for extension and a 1.53% compensation increase. Copies of a public summary of the superintendent's evaluation will be available at the next meeting, and the proposed contract for consideration is attached for everyone. Um, is there any discussion? We are quiet. Okay, very good. This item will come back to us at our next meeting. Also on first reading from the superintendent, item 9.3.1, and I'll turn that over to you, Dr. Joel. Yes, consistent with um, other salary, uh, negotiated salary packages for professional staff, I'm recommending for the uh, associate superintendents and assistant superintendent a salary increase, of package increase of 2.06% and a total package of 2.26%. Copies of those contracts are also attached. Very good. Is there any discussion? Okay, this item will come back to us at our next meeting. Also on first reading from the superintendent, item 9.3.2, Title VI, Indian Education Program, Dr. Larson. Thank you, Mrs. Duncan. I'd invite Dr. Hicks and Dr. Butes to come forward to share some information with you concerning not only this grant application, but the Native American Youth Demonstration Grant as well. But I want to welcome her to the Lincoln Public Schools. She we're extremely fortunate to have her join our team and look forward to her leadership and contributions. Thank you. Talk about both grants because we are really and family. Go ahead. Thank you. Yes, thank you for a uh, little specialist and then there's me to uh, help um, run the grant. Uh, we have quite a bit more money um, and so we have a half-time secretary which is something that we didn't have before. Uh, the support for our Native students has just, uh, it's grown so much. We've, we're very happy to uh, be able to offer structured supports um, in academic areas, in social areas, in behavioral and emotional areas, um, and cultural supports. Right now, we're very happy to have Native therapists on board to help with our students who are experiencing um, issues. We've had um, quite a few crises, um, suicide attempts, and ideations that we've been able to nip. And um, that's a very high priority for me right now. Um, we want to show our students that it, uh, a high school diploma opens up doors for them. Um, they can go any way they want. They don't have to go to college. Uh, they can become a chef. Uh, they can uh, become a landscaper if they want. Uh, we can help them get into a college and uh, pick a college that has the sort of training that they're looking for. Uh, a lot of these kids have never had anybody to guide them through a process like this. Um, we, I have uh, several people uh, I identified who I want to bring here to talk to our students and show them what they've done with their arts. Uh, Karis Jackson is um, a quite a famous artist um, and she does beadwork. She's Crow and, and Cheyenne. Um, and then Rhonda Holy, Holy Bear uh, makes dolls. Um, Bethany Yellowtail uh, does exquisite beadwork but she also has a brand called Nod that's in some of the uh, high-end uh, children's stores. Uh, and if you, if you know anything about shoes, those are uh, Christian Louboutin shoes up there that are all beaded, and I know someone would pay a pretty penny for them. Um, I want to uh, introduce them to ideas of, uh, from physicians. Uh, we have uh, quite a few American Indian physicians who would be happy to come and talk to the students and let them know what they need to uh, plan when they're in high school and uh, ha what uh, road to take toward college to be a physician. Uh, a chef, uh, he happens to be a Sioux and he's in Minneapolis and he's really made a big name for himself. And he's always hiring somebody. Uh, right now he's looking for um, a prep cook 
and uh, some student who was interested in food or uh, some of the other uh, areas that, that they're um, advocating among his people uh, could get a job and learn a lot more. Uh, we have m musicians uh, who play around uh, the world. Uh, this, these people, the girl is the drummer, and I know that uh, we have great um, music programs and, and uh, drama programs here in LPS. We also are able to offer the staff uh, professional development training uh, uh, to, so that they can learn more about the, the students and their families. And uh, I think that would strengthen the relationship and probably help improve the graduation rate here at Lincoln Public Schools. Um, here again, I'll mention it one more time about the Native mental health professionals uh, because they have agreed to produce some webinars for us so that we can have it on tape and uh, they can offer uh, some training to the counselors and social workers at the schools and reserve times for more focused training. Uh, and I think that will, that will help them to understand our American Indian students and the obstacles that they have to overcome in order to graduate from high school. We want to invite visitors from all disciplines and trades and arts to come and expose our students to what success can look like after high school. Uh, and some of them have agreed. I, I would love to bring uh, some playwrights and poets to work with some of the faculty uh, to help them uh, plan lessons of, uh, that include more American Indian uh, content. We see bright futures for our children, and uh, we want to see them succeed. This is the 21st century, and we want these American Indian students to be welcomed into the 21st century. They can still be American Indian and live in today's world, and that's what we would like to see. Um, and I, I think we're, we're working at a pretty fast clip right now, uh, getting these students uh, involved. Learning is an American Indian tradition and I want us to make some tracks that people can remember us by in a very good way. Thank you very much for having me here um, and if you have any questions. All right, thank you so much. We're, we're all beaming back here, but there is one school board member that is beaming especially. Um, Ms. Beyer, would you like to say anything? Yeah, first of all, I wanna thank Linda Hicks and Dr. Butte for um, bringing this presentation. I particularly wanna um, thank uh, Dr. Hicks for pursuing this grant and bringing more opportunities for our Native youth here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, Dr. Butte, could you um, explain to me how you're doing outreach to uh, Native youth? Um, and I'll preface why I'm asking that because a lot of Native youth that I'm in contact with uh, are actually biracial, and it's not unusual. And, and sometimes they don't mark Native American on a census or on um, an LPS uh, form. So how do you get over that barrier? We have a, what the federal government has put out, it's a 506 form we call it. And those forms are filled out by uh, students whose families have a member who's affiliated with a tribe. It could be a grandparent. Uh, just so it's a lineal uh, descent from that grandparent. You can show the, the grandparent's uh, tribal affiliation and, and that, would, uh, uh, that would allow the uh, grandchild to participate in, in this program. I have to say that we look at all of the kids who are willing to identify as American Indian and we uh, go around with our 506 forms uh, trying to get anyone who hasn't completed one to do so. Uh, you're right, if uh, they check more than one box, then uh, for whatever reason our system doesn't pick it up. Now, um, 
if uh, there might be a way that uh, we, we could talk to one of the people in tech and find out if there's a way to, to work around that, because we would like that too. Um, but if you take a look at the 506 forms, we have a few more than 600 American Indian students. But if you look at the people who've simply identified as American Indian, um, we get over twice that many student names. And, uh, and then going along with what you say about checking the uh, more than one race, uh, who knows how many more we would have if we could, uh, you know, get the pick pick that apart, tease that apart. And I encourage you to continue that good work. I know it's a huge challenge. One other caveat from my personal experience since I adopted my child. Um, with the support of our local Native community is adopted children who may not have as much contact with their uh, birth family. In the, in the case of my son, he always has had contact, but sometimes that might be a missing link too. And, and I worry about that because particularly adoptive, uh, adopted and foster Native youth need to be connected to their culture um, because it's easy to get lost yes, and, and not having that anchor in your life can lead to so many issues. You have no idea how happy I am that you're here. I am so happy for this grant. I'm looking forward to this good work. Well, thank you, and we will definitely keep you updated with, with what we have going on right now. We've got a lot of things, a lot of things happening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this item will come back to us at our next meeting. Also on first reading from the superintendent, items 9.3.3, the Clefcorn Roofing Repair Project, Dr. Standish. Um, yes, this is a Clefcorn repair due to hail damage as it is covered by insurance. Perfect. Is and there our any insurance fund? In our insurance fund. Any discussion? Okay, this item will come back to us at our next meeting. Also on first read item, item 9.3.4, wheelchair school buses number 9579. Dr. Standish again. Um, yes, these were buses that are identified through the budget process to purchase this year. Um, and so they are before you and will come back based on the price point being the $700,000. So they are funded within the existing budget. Good, any discussion? Okay, this will come back to us at our next meeting as well. All right, on to second reading. Um, from the superintendent, item 10.2.1, processing of USDA commodities 9605, 9608, 9609. Is there a motion for approval? Ms. Danick? I would move approval. Is there a second, Mr. Boswell? Second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Munger? Um, just one question. Have we done this before? Is this, this is a usual thing, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. We do this every year. So it was first reading of the last meeting, second reading right. for approval here, and we normally make these purchases and plans in advance of the school year. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Seeing none, Laura, please call the roll on the motion to approve item 10.2.1. Right? Mr. Boswell? Yes. Ms. Dyer? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Ms. Mungard? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. Also on second reading from the superintendent, item 10.2.2, tuition charges for 2019-2020. Is there a motion for approval? Uh, Ms. Mungard? I move that we approve 10.2.2. Is there a second? Uh, Mr. Ba, Ms. Discussion? Okay, seeing none, Laura, please call the roll on the motion to approve item 10.2.2. Mrs. Danning? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Ms. Beyer? Yes. Mr. Schulte? Yes. Ms. Mumbard? Yes. Mr. Mayhew? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. I do not have any emergency actions, and there are not any items removed from consent agenda. That brings us to informational items and reports. Are there any board committees wishing to report tonight? Mr. Boswell? Thank you, Mrs. Duncan. A uh, report from the Safe and Successful Kids Interlocal Board. We met Thursday morning last week in the LPS boardroom. That board consists of three representatives from LPS and three from the city. The Safe and Successful Kids Initiative provides protective, preventative, and proactive programs 
with equal funding from LPS and the city. At the meeting, the Interlocal Board approved a request to reallocate $55,000 in the current year budget from scholarships to direct education and wellness programming. Our CLC sites this year were not requesting scholarship funds at the levels that were anticipated. Both of those line items are within the protective programming category. The board also approved the evaluation plan for protective programming, including school resource officers, as required by our memorandum of understanding with the city. This plan is based on the requirements in the MOU, as well as input from a community listening session facilitated by Leadership Lincoln last fall. It's been described as, quote, one of the most comprehensive SRO evaluation plans in the country, end quote. The evaluation plan calls for data collection starting with the 2019-20 school year, with the first annual report occurring next fall. And I would especially like to thank Joe Wright, Russ Ewing, and Dr. Leslie Eastman for their leadership and collaborative work with the City and Lincoln Police Department. They went above and beyond the usual amount of above and beyond that we've come to expect. And finally, the board approved the SSK interlocal budget for 2019-2020. The budget funds protective, preventative, and proactive programs within the parameters of the interlocal agreement. The interlocal board is required to submit that budget to LPS and the city prior to May 1st and may not increase the budget more than 5% annually. The total budget for 2019-20 is $2,184,000, which is a 4% increase. 30% of the net funding is for protective programming, 26% for preventative programming, and 43% for proactive programming. The next meeting of an interlocal board will be June 20th, 7.30 a.m. in the City Council Chambers. The board will receive a report on preventative programming, including mental health services, and will elect its officers for 2019-20. That concludes my report. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Paswell. Ms. Byer, do you have a question? Can I ask a question? Yes. As a Go ahead. Report? Absolutely. I was wondering, uh, did I hear that right, that the CLC scholarships, you didn't have many requests for that? So we had uh, fewer requests, yes. For, so for the first year, for the 18-19 year, we had an amount allocated uh, to provide scholarships for CLCs. Mm -hmm. The request that actually came up from the CLCs was less than that allocated amount, uh -huh. and so the remainder was used for uh, additional programming within the CLCs. Okay. Can, I'm wondering uh, what kind of information is going out to families, because I know that in my neighborhood schools, often um, families are not sending their kids to CLC because of the cost. <coughs> So I'm wondering if there's a disconnect. Well, and first I would recommend that those families uh, contact their building principal. is usually a good source to connect them. Um, but Nola uh, Derby Bennett, who of course is director of the CLC programs, talked a little bit about the way that the uh, school uh, community coordinators helped connect uh, those families with those resources. Okay. Because my experience is, is that a lot of times um, people um, in my neighborhood are often low-income minority or new to our country and they um, are kind of uh, shy about asking questions and making requests and particularly don't want to go and be a burden to other people so they wouldn't naturally go up and ask anybody for such a scholarship. Yeah, and we can certainly get more information on that as well as sometimes there's a language barrier in those circumstances yeah. and I know we have a a pretty thorough translation department, so we can we can check that out and get a little more information. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and Annie, did you want to say something? Are we doing like a CLC survey currently, uh, an input survey? Um, Mr. Neal, do you want to? I think we are that? correct. Sure. So it might be interesting to see what we we'll get feedback from that. Just an overall survey. But I got. <coughs> I was just thinking that there it was a uh, almost like one of those. Temperature surveys is what we call it. Climate surveys? Yeah, it wasn't a climate, but I mean, it's like, you know, every so often, I mean, it wasn't a climate in the sense that I think it was, I was just wondering, because that would seem to me that would answer part of the question. Could possibly. Just checking, when we have results, then we'll be able to, I'm looking to see Noah's nodding. Yes, when we have results, we'll be able to share that. Actually, we want to, I'm sorry to interrupt on my point, because those people aren't going to be in the CLC system, because they didn't go and get the scholarship to get into the system to well, begin I, with. I understand that, but one of the questions was about communication with parents, so it might might show us a little bit of something about 
how is that going? That would be my, okay. having taken the survey, that was one of the questions and I thought that would be a question that could show us the breadth or lack of what's yeah, happening. Probably two separate questions. One, the first question is how do we currently communicate and what can we do to improve that? And two, what within the survey would help inform us on our right. communication in general? Yeah. And so we'll follow up on both of those and get back to you. Very good. Okay, so what I'm hearing is Mr. Neal will follow up on all of those. Does this need to go to student learning or to another committee, or can we just handle it this way? We're okay? We just do a follow up and okay. we'll go from there. Perfect. Great. Everyone's okay? Wonderful. Okay, we will go on. Um, from the Career Academy, Mr. Schulte does not have a report this time, but will the next time. And it brings us up to Dr. Joel's report. Yeah, just two things, and then I, I think Mr. Duncan and I are going to tag team a meeting we had uh, just a little bit ago. It's graduation's four weeks, and another year's in the books, at least for, for seniors. And thanks to the board, each of you, for signing up and as willing participants in the graduation ceremony. As you know, this is a culminating activity that really gives us a chance to see our products as we send them off into the world. And um, it'll be a busy day, as it always is, on that, that one Sunday. And then this Thursday's big hearing. 289, it'll be 289 is being heard. There's been a lot documented, a lot, a lot of discussion. I think. The, um, we, we, we're going to have some involvement in, with regard to testimony, but it's, um, it's the sales tax shift to buy down property tax, and of course people are pretty passionate about, uh, about both sides of that, so it'll be interesting to see how that gets resolved. So if you have some, some time, um, I, I'm certain this one will be on NETTV if you have an interest in seeing how that debate goes. And then just uh, prior to the school board meeting, Mrs. Duncan, Mrs. Danik, myself, Dr. Hunter Pertle, and Dr. Larson met with about 10 high school students from all of our city high schools to just have a uh, casual conversation about their experience in our schools. And we didn't have a set agenda, but I think uh, we didn't need one. I think we did, uh, they did a pretty good job of raising topics, and we raised topics. I think it was very enlightening. We covered a, a host of subjects from safety and security to testing to um, confidential reporting to just kind of the things that, that go through kids' minds. And I think we gleaned some pretty good information and certainly some things to follow up on. And i turn it over to Mrs. Duncan if she wanted to add. And many of you may remember that I had some specific goals I wanted to finish up this year, and one of them was I wanted to have a, a student advisory group, a group of students that would just tell us how they're feeling. And so this is what we started with was this group, and it was very informational for us. There were things that we didn't realize um, were going on, but they also had such great things. And one of the questions we asked them was, you know, what will you remember most when you graduate? What, what do you love most? And they all said their teachers. They all loved their teachers. They loved their time at LPS. So that's something that I'd like us to see going forward. I don't know how they can do this building level, but I, I think that we need to hear from all students. Anything I missed? I think it was really important to hear that what they thought about the safety and security discussions we've been having over the last two years. And believe it or not, as much as we talked about it, they still think we need to talk about it more, and they think the kids need to talk about it more and do more within their buildings. I was impressed with their level of, uh, of expertise on what they feel and don't feel about what's going on in their buildings. They talked about diversity in a way that I hadn't heard it talked about in a very long time and how the kids are more accepting and maybe the adults need to catch up. Mm -hmm. and, and that was really impressive of these young people. And they're full of hope and lots of dreams. And they want it better for the next generation. I think I asked them a generational question uh, when we talked about, do you feel safe? And because my daughter graduated in 1999, I shared with them that my daughter came home and cried that day from high school as a senior because they were killing kids in Columbine. And I remember the look on her face that day. It stuck with me. And I asked them if it was generational. And they think it can get better. And that's a great deal of hope with these kids that, that many of us forget. The future generation is right there working with us. So they want more, we discussion, they actually would like to have more input into curriculum. So I'm teaming them up with the Nebraska Department of Ed, because I think that's where they have to start it. But I thought that was an interesting, thing. and they picked on math a lot. Yeah. Not math, but math. They did pick on math a lot. They want to know why logarithms were important. So. <laughs> 
Do we miss anything? I, I would add just one other thing. Uh, Mrs. Danik was there today too, but um, the annual teammate scholarship uh, award ceremony, I think Mrs. Duncan was there earlier, but we missed each other and got there pretty late. And I thought that was one of the best student speeches I've ever heard. Yes. It was a young, um, a soon to graduate Asian American young lady who in a very articulate and passionate way described what we all know to be true about students that experience crisis and trauma and how a teammate and a teacher and whatever support system that, that they can conjure up, uh, they, they become very reliant on. And she gave um, just a wonderful, wonderful testimony to the 1,200 mentors that we have in our community that we're so fortunate to have that are helping students like her realize their dreams and how difficult it is at times as a child when you get knocked off center and things in your life no longer appear to be consistent, that it, that it does take adult intervention. And so, you know, I, I, I want to call out our teammates program but also all of our community mentors and volunteers and support programs because that's, that's why our graduation rate is as good as it is, but it's also why we heard today that, that even, even raising a lot of things that they would change about high school, at the end of the day when we asked them the culminating question, you know, tell us about your, your, your overall experience, they all gave us pretty high grades saying that um, LPS education rocks, and, and you know that always makes us feel pretty good. So that concludes my report. Very good. All right. Um, are there any questions on the monthly financial report? Okay. So that brings us to announcements of upcoming events for the board. Someone hand me their paper. We um, paper. Paper. Thank you. Oh yeah, the two of us figuring this out. Okay, hold on. We'll, we'll figure this out. Um, see, see this. Okay, well, um, this Saturday we have the Backpack Extra Mile Walk at 9.15 at East High. Um, the TCA Joint Board Meeting at 8 o'clock a.m. on the 7th of May at TCA, yep. And the Military Service Senior Recognition Night that same night at 6.30 at Northeast. And then May 8th we have the LPS Retirement Celebration 5 o'clock at the Lincoln Country Club. The Monday, the 13th of May, Mayor's ne Neighborhood Roundtable at 5.30, and that brings us to our next board meeting on May 14th. We did it. Okay, that brings us to our second opportunity for public comment. Anyone wishing to come forward? Okay, seeing none, I have a request from staff for a closed session for items two, real estate, three, litigation, six, personnel, and seven, legal advice. Is there a motion, Ms. Danik? I would move that we recess this board meeting and go into closed session for item number two, real estate, number three, litigation, number six, personnel, and number seven, legal advice. Okay, is there a second? Ms. Mumgard. I will second that. Any discussion? Okay, Laura, would you please call a roll on the motion to go into closed session for items two, real estate, three, litigation, six, personnel, and seven, legal advice. Mr. Mayhew. Yes. Ms. Mumgard. Yes. Mr. Schulte. Yes. Ms. Byer? Yes. Mr. Boswell? Yes. Mrs. Danik? Yes. Mrs. Duncan? Yes. This meeting is in recess for the closed session.